Hey guys, Sleepy Reader here. Uh, I should be running off to work, but I thought I'd uh, try to chat about uh, three of the comic or four of the comic books I got this uh, Wednesday. I actually got nine of them, so a lot to read. Uh, <clears throat> Particularly Punk Rock Jesus. I think this took me two or three times as long to read as, as a regular superhero comic book usually does. Uh, and it was very good. I loved the first issue. This issue does slow things down a little bit. Or, you know, we're not getting as much new information as we did in the first one. We're, everything's being expanded on. And in a very good way, the art remains really good. Um... The detail and the use of black and white is excellent. I am kind of coming over to actually liking the kind of rough paper that they use. Um, I'd say the tone in this issue more than ever is one of social satire, uh, done very well. But there's still a lot of characterization and thought behind the characters, even though it is kind of a, a darker social satire. There's even these pages without much text on them, and it still took me a long time to read. Uh, it's just a lot of story for your dollar, um, in a good way. So it's not like, oh God, I've got to chug through all this writing that, that isn't forwarding the story or anything. It's all relevant. Um, so in a way, I, I feel this issue is kind of a setup for maybe more exciting things happening next issue. I am starting to wonder more and more about the title, Punk Rock Jesus. Are we going to see the, um, the young Jesus clone, if that's what he really is, grow up um, to a teenager or something? Because right now, though he was born in the first issue, he's six months old in this issue. It feels like the next issue should continue on you know, with the events of when he's six months old. So I don't know if eventually he's going to grow up to be a punk rock Jesus. Um, so I'm still very curious about that. However it goes, I have a lot of faith in it because the second issue is, you know, just really well done. So, yeah, so the only warning is it's a little bit of a letdown from the first issue just because there's not as much of that excitement of the new. Um, but it it does very... It fulfills the promise of the first issue, and it continues the story without any sign of, of let up or weakness. So, if you like the first issue of Punk Rock Jesus, or if all this social satire in the near future with uh, the clone of Jesus and environmental stuff, and all well, the environmental stuff is minor, um, and complex characters uh, appeal to you. Take a look at Punk Rock Jesus. Batman, it's kind of the, this set of comics may be the set of comics with overly high expectations. So, although with Batman, my expectations have been lowered because I saw a little preview of the art online. I think this page caught my attention and I thought, oh no, we're going to get a manga style Batman in the middle of this Greg Capullo. Um, Scott Snyder runs. Scott Snyder's still writing it, but the artist, well, one of the artists is Becky Cloonan, <clears throat> who I was not familiar with. But much to my surprise, when I actually read it, I liked the art a lot. Um, I think she does she does layouts really well and atmosphere and storytelling really well. The only thing I don't like is the cute manga eyes that she does. Um, but I kind of... I wasn't in love with the writing. Uh, it's all sort of well done... well done... Um, to me, by the numbers in a certain way. It's, it's very well thought out. I'm sure it fits very well into Scott Snyder's larger scheme for Batman. Um, the main aspect of it is we have this young girl. She must be over 16. She's emancipated from her parents. She and her brother live alone. And she both goes to school and she works on the power grid of Gotham City, um, which is kind of stretching it a bit. 
Um, and she makes interesting discoveries about Batman and Batman's relationship to the power grid. And she helps out Batman, um, and he doesn't want her help. And uh, I'm sure we're going to be seeing more of her that we're being set up for that. So Becky Cloonan's art is, does a very good sort of view of, of Gotham. And it there's kind of a tradition of occasionally viewing the superhero from the outside, seeing what how he appears to other people. It's been done a lot with Batman uh, and with other people. And it, um, to me, it harkens back to Will Eisner, who always gave us different views of his hero, the spirit. In fact, uh, more often than not, views from other people rather than from the spirit's point of view. Uh, and Becky Cloonan's artwork reminds me a bit of Will Eisner in the, in the layouts and, huh, my computer completely went to sleep while I was talking. It's a very insulting computer. Um, so I'm struggling to say why I was not, you know, and it's heightened expectations. It's a, a very decent comic book. But I think particularly issues uh, 2 through 10 of the Scott Snyder, Greg Capullo run really raised my expectations of of what can be delivered here. And then, as other people have pointed out, it, there's a very jarring art change. I wonder what will show up on the computer. Uh, but this, the second artist is very good. He's just nothing like um, Becky Cloonan. Uh, a very different style in layouts and sort of the rendering of figures and and whatnot. So once you're really into the Becky Cloonan, then you're suddenly thrown into this completely different world of... I should look up the name of the artist. You can see it's nicely detailed art and everything, but it, it just comes from a different space. So I'd like to see more of this artist somewhere else. Um, and that artist's name is, come on, you're up, oh, Andy Clark. Well, that name sounds familiar, but I don't know from where. Another odd thing is the last six pages are co-written by James Tynion the fourth. Anyway, to me, it's like... Scott Snyder said, I'm going to write a girl's comic book today. Um, I liked the theme of her homosexual brother and dealing with, uh, you know, harassment and gay bashing in school. But maybe there I was a little uncomfortable with, with thinking about the reality of things of Batman saves gay people from being beaten up. Um, because in the real world, <laughs> I guess in the real world, in we none of us have superheroes to come save us, so it shouldn't bother me. But it bothered me to have, you know, a teenager dealing with harassment in school uh, by, although he's probably about to be killed if Batman hadn't showed up. And in that case, and uh, maybe just this entry of reality or or a reality that I understand because of. Uh, I feel some of my gay friends may have experienced somewhat the same things. Uh, that uh, you get saved by Batman, that this group of boys is probably going to kill you, um, but they face no consequences other than being scared away by Batman. They're, and by boys, they're probably 17 and 18-year-olds. Um, they should be going to jail. Uh, it shouldn't be considered... You know, threatening the life of a gay teenager shouldn't be considered a light crime that you should just be scared away from and told not to do again. Uh, you know, with fists and knives and kicking. Um, but, you know, it's just a comic book. I shouldn't get all deep about it. There's a, cer I, there's a certain cuteness to the dialogue, which other than the big eyes is not... It's like Scott Snyder. Nah, I'm totally struggling with this. Anyway, there's a cuteness and there's an on-the-spotness 
you know, it, the book starts with the seven words that changed her life, and, and then at the end we get the seven words that we cha changed her life with a very minor, cute twist on that. Um, and I don't want to give that away, so... But I, I just thought it was all kind of pat, and look at me, I'm writing a girl's comic book. Uh, so, I don't know. It was still actually good. If you're into Batman, I don't think you should skip this issue because I think these characters will come up again. So I'm just overanalyzing it. Batman and Robin is a comic book that I enjoy and don't overanalyze for the most part. This issue continued to have lots of great artwork. Uh, I like this set of villains, Terminus, and all these kind of losers who believe that Batman destroyed their, their lives. Um, <clears throat> and I really like the subplot of the War of the Robins. And I think that that, so I think the Terminus story was wrapped up pretty nicely. Um, but the War of the Robins thing seemed, I, it seems at this point to be closed off in a clever way. I mean, it was done the right way with, uh, with Nightwing sort of putting Damien in his place in a kind, gentle way. Uh, but I was enjoying the War of the Robins, and I was hoping it would stretch out more. And I think things were kind of wrapping up here because we're coming to the Zero issue. And I feel a little angry about the Zero issues in general as a kind of interruption in our regularly broadcast show. Um, so anyway, uh, if you enjoy Batman and you, or you've been enjoying Batman and Robin, I wouldn't pick up with this issue because it's the end of, I think, a three-part, three-story, three-issue arc. But this was a good end to it. Um, it does, I'm noticing maybe, you know, because I'm reading a lot more Batman now than I have in quite a while, you know, Batman just surviving anything. So he, he detonates some kind of bomb um, in the river, which is a problem itself too, or in the harbor, because it's still some kind of poisonous, noxious bomb that's going off in the water. But anyway, that saves the day, and then Batman falls off the missile and just oops, floats, floats down to Gotham, I guess. It just seems like Batman can do anything a little too much. I mean, when he needs to, he can fly. He can survive being sucked into jet airplanes in other issues. Um, it should be a bit harder for him to survive... Uh, falling from a from a airborne missile, uh, but other than that, I mean, I'm being picky, and in this comic book more than the Scott Snyder comic book, I accept the comic bookiness of it without any more explanation. So uh, the last comic I'll talk about in this video is Archer and Armstrong, also because if I guess it fits in with the expectations kind of thing. I've been not picking up Valiant and waiting for the trades because I've been hearing a lot of good reviews, uh, basically because of the, the price point. And um, I broke down on this one because I love Archer and Armstrong, or I loved the original Barry Windsor Smith run on Archer and Armstrong in the 90s. Um, and this is an okay re retelling of it, and it probably will get better once the setup is done, because the whole issue has to convince, has to bring Archer and Armstrong together. And that's not the best part. The best part of Archer and Armstrong is once they are working together and the wonderful contrast of their personalities. Um, the art was nice. The writing was, was decent, but not nearly as funny as, as Barry Windsor Smith's. Again, I wonder once they get it once they get the setup going. So, I am looking forward to issue two of this. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they put it all together. Although maybe I should still wait for the trade, given the the cost. Um, so I'll be thinking about that. So sorry for a low key, perhaps struggling more than usual for, to get my thoughts together. I just wanted to get another video out, but I'm, I'm running late for work and uh, definitely sleepy, haven't had my morning coffee. So I'll, I'll see you guys in another video quite soon. Um, I have five more comic books from this week to talk about.